Hello listeners, and if there's anybody new here that we've met at the San Francisco Writers Conference, welcome. This is Words to Write By. Thank you so much for checking out our podcast. We have a great episode. We've just started a new book. And at the end of the podcast, if you've enjoyed this, we'll talk about how you can support us through Patreon. Okay, on with the show. On with the show. Is there a writing craft book on your bedside table? Has it been there for a while? Do you keep meaning to get past chapter two or chapter one or just the first page? Then the Words to Write By podcast is for you. Hi, I'm Renee. I teach composition and creative writing to college students. My background is in poetry, but I'm working on my memoir. And I'm Kim. I'm trained as a science journalist, but now I'm trying my hand at short fiction. Each week we'll be tackling a chapter of some well-known, but perhaps not so well-read writing craft book. Together, we'll uncover brilliant insights, face the hard truths, and totally disagree when the author is wrong. This is our podcast, after all. And then, we're going to take what we learn and apply it to our own writing. By doing the book's suggested exercises. We're inviting you to read along, or just tune in for the Cliff Notes version. We're committed to improving our own craft, one writing advice book at a time, and we'd love for you to join us. Hello, and welcome to Words to Write By. Hello, dear listener. We may be a bit rusty. Renee has been traveling Europe, and we have not been recording for a little bit. We did record while I was out there, though. Yep, and we really discovered how great it is to have microphones. Yes, yeah, the sound quality is very different. (laughs) (laughs) So when you were traveling Europe, did you keep with your journal writing and everything? Uh, I kept with the journal writing of the events of the day. I did have a chance to write my own personal stuff once. It was kind of sad. I've noticed that me and Max, we both kind of go at vacation as how much can we fit in a day. I would say half of the days we went to two museums, not one. We were like walking and going from place to place. There is just no time to sit. And it's not even just time. It's like you need that mental space. You can't just say, okay, I'm going to stop by a cafe for 15 minutes and just write. Or some people can, but not me. Not me. Anyway, so now I'm back. But I have, I have started waking up because of the, you know, time difference. I wake up at 4.35 in the morning now. And I'm trying to keep that up because it's great. There's no phone. I don't have to check my email. Like I've got a whole two hours just to myself. And that really does make a big difference. Fantastic. How about you, Kim? What words have you written? So I had kind of an opposite effect where the rest of my family took a vacation this past week and I have been alone in the house. When the cat's away. It's not that I've written that much, but I've realized I've been able to spend a whole day is just focused on my book. And every little offset, like I should check this one out or I need to work on this or this is an issue. Like I've had the time to do it. So I, I miss them, but it's been great. I won't tell them, I promise. Okay, that's good. (laughs) (laughs) Well, on to the episode. In today's podcast, we give our first impressions of our new book, Jack Bickham's Scene and Structure. And enthusiastic students that we are, we identify his central thesis. Then it's on to chapter two, where we answer some novice novelist's questions and discuss Bickham's approach to openings. For our exercise, Kim Bickhamizes her new novel's opening page. And as a bonus, Renee has a message for any former Borders employees who had to work the late night Harry Potter shift. On to the new book. The new book! The book, by the way, that we're talking about is Jack Bickham's Scene and Structure. Jack Bickham's Scene and Structure. And if you have not listened to our um, introduction and interview, you should go back to one more episode um, and then you'll hear all about the book and why we chose it. Mm-hmm. So first impressions, I'm kind of giddy reading this book because it lays things out so clearly. He doesn't waste a word and right away you're told what to do. It reminds me of myself as a student, at-risk student, (laughs) someone who didn't have a very good background and 
And I went through college just being like, why don't you just tell me what to do? I didn't learn until later that the kind of teaching a lot of colleges do is called inductive learning, which is they try to get you to discover it for yourself. I don't got time for that crap. <laughs> I really don't, and I don't like that. So me and all my ESL students, I got your back. You take my class, <laughs> I give you both inductive and deductive learning. <laughs> this book is all deductive learning. Well, what I noticed first when I opened it up is that it is single spaced. Like all the other books we've had are double spaced and there's this beautiful white space and this is like, nope, we've got too much to fit in here. We are just gonna single line space. And you said this was actually a product of the Reader Digest company? Yeah. It's very Reader's Digest, isn't it? Yeah. That really tight writing. Yeah. It um, looks like it was done on a typewriter. The font even looks like that. That was the first thing I noticed was how much text. It's kind of like stereo instructions. The other thing is our previous books were much larger in scope or more broad. Very Bad Berries was, was, was its own thing. But the art of fiction, you know, he was going to cover everything a student needed. And here, Bickham's basically has a single idea, like a concept. And this book is all set to support that concept or allow you to apply that concept. Yeah, it's very nuts and bolts. It gets down to the nitty gritty. In fact, he covers the history of the novel about three centuries worth in about four sentences. <laughs> no wasting time. Um, speaking about his overall thesis and all that, what did you find for that? Well, he doesn't quite say this is my thesis. So I'm just going to read a quote. And this is what I feel like kind of encapsulates the whole book. Structure is nothing more than a way of looking at your story material so that it's organized in a way that's both logical and dramatic. And to continue for a second, why do we need structure in fiction? Understanding. As writers, so our stories will hold together and make sense, we need structure so readers can understand the story we're reading and feel something as a result. That was what I thought was the thesis. Yeah, he's got, I mean, this is some vocabulary. He talks about structure and form. Mm -hmm. And he compares them to a house. So structure is the beams and the bolts and the things that go into building a house and form is the style or what the real estate agent is selling yeah and the thing he said about structures it doesn't necessarily matter what's on the outside of the house you're almost always going to be using these elements of structure within it to hold it together yeah it is the basics of storytelling whatever story you're telling you're going to still need these things mm -hmm. you can't have a novel without having words right so it just goes kind of beyond that Right. So, okay, writing a romance versus writing a thriller. They have different forms. But in the end, your hero or heroine is on a particular arc. And even though in one case it's to save the world and the other one it's to get the girl, there are elements to both of those story arcs that are similar. That's the structure. And that's what he's going to be. Right. Book. He also addresses even more basic form. They both have scenes. It doesn't matter if it's a Harlequin romance or a sci-fi book. Part of reading a novel is that there's scenes. And that's what I took as the thesis, which was there are patterns, structural patterns. And if you learn the structural patterns of a novel, it frees you to focus on the story you want to tell. It's like a lot of artwork forms. It's like if you want to be a painter, you learn technique for painting. And then if you want to go out and do nature stuff you do that if you do a portrait you do that that's the story that's the the concept but you're still going to mix your paints and put them on your brush and use the various flicks of your wrist and here he says if we teach you the structure you'll just be able to go to town on your actual story because that stuff won't get in your way i actually remember that quote and i felt it was very empowering i got a little push of oh oh i'll know what i'm doing and then i can do what i want i got kind of excited before we go on, I wanted to mention that because this book is very practical, unlike Gardner's idea of like you do exercises that you're not really attached to because that allows you to develop your technique and your voice. In this case, most of the advice appears to be directly to the novel that you're writing. We'll see if this continues, but for right now, I think that we'll be able to use this, this information 
in this book to directly apply it to our current projects. And I thought before we go on, we just, in case anybody's new here, these are the projects we're working on. What, what's your project? What's your real writing project? My real writing project is the memoir. <laughs> the beast that is the memoir. So yes, I am working on that. And what are you working on, Kim? And I have a, a fantasy story. It's a classic. People get zapped into a fantasy world and have to fulfill a quest. Most of my stuff before this has been more literary. <laughs> Speculative fiction well not even just speculative fiction but more magical realism yeah like 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 stuff that that maybe this advice wouldn't apply to as much mm. like short stories that had a little bit weirder structure however my current piece is all about scene and structure and i think this is going to really help me you know i think this book is actually going to help a lot of listeners because there is a lot of books on process and it doesn't take long for you to figure out yeah, showing up to every day is really helpful, but when you don't have the, the tools, it starts to wear thin. But this is like, I will tell you what to do. So moving on to chapter two, strategy, how to start your story and how to end it. He um, has some questions that novice novelists might ask and I thought we could start by going through this and seeing like which of these five questions do you feel applies to you Renee or which ones were ones that you wanted answers to so your question was do I have these questions <laughs> so these are the questions that seem to plague the novel novelist since neither of us have anything published I think we could be novel novelists yes we could be novel novelists Did novice you... novelists Novist novelist. Novice novelist. Say that time five times fast. No, don't. We don't have time. Okay. So the first question is, how long should my novel be? Kim, have you ever asked yourself that question while writing your novel? Um, only in the sense of I've written 20,000 words. How many more do I have to write? <laughs> but the other part of it is I tend to write long. So there's a lot of it. Well, I'm getting to 60,000 words. I'm not to the midpoint of the novel. Is that a bad thing? <laughs> But this strikes me as one of those questions that can be answered with a quick internet search, which maybe was not available back in, when was this book written? 1993? Uh, what do we got here? 1993, yeah. Yeah. This was probably actually a much more critical question back before you could Google it. Yeah. You could just see like a book and how big it was, but you didn't really know how many words it had. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, we've got, where should I start my story? And this is, I think, the heart of this chapter. Right. And it is what has plagued me since the dawn of man. It's actually really hard for me to figure out where to start my memoir. Even though this book doesn't mention memoir, memoir is very similar to like a novel. People read them very much like novels. Or the best memoirs are really similar to a novel. Yeah. I struggle with this. Actually, a lot of people struggle with this because a lot of people want to start with like birth. And it's like, no, that's an autobiography. And you shouldn't really be writing your own autobiography unless you're like a hundred and you're famous. So if you're just writing a memoir, it's a slice of life. But where do you begin? And that has always been a trouble for me because the trouble started from the very beginning. <laughs> so I, I, I've spent a long time trying to figure out where my story starts. Have you ever wondered that? Or did it just, you just knew? It always clicks in my head and like, this is where I'm going to start it. However, I've read various critique groups and one of the first things I get when I start a novel is like, are you sure you don't want to start it closer to this and this happening? <laughs> I do remember when I would write poetry, a lot of times first stanzas will get cut very quickly because it, we call it throat clearing. You think you need the first stanza, but you don't. Mm -hmm. My take is that when you're starting a story, you need to get so much information to the audience so they can understand, especially if you're writing fantasy or speculative fiction. You can't just say, you know, it was a bright sunny morning in small town USA and everyone just knows what to look for. Yeah, the world building aspect well, of fantasy, it's kind of its own beast. There's so much information that has to get out so that someone starting the story knows where they're at. So my issue always in starting is how to fit all that stuff in. And then I'll read it to somebody and they'll say, oh, I think it should be close to this action. I feel like, but no, you, you, you only want it close to the action because you already know that they're walking on a cliffside next to a nuclear war zone or something like that. Ah. You know, it's, 
So while I know where I want to start my stories, I think I need to have a better idea of why I start my stories there. Yeah, info dumping is a thing, right? Like there's a lot of people, I, I haven't actually had to deal with any of this, but building that world, a lot of writers will do that thing called info dumping and they tell you not to do that. How do you not do that? I have yet to find that advice. How and when should I end my story? Is this an issue for you, Renee? Uh, it was for a long time, but I figured it out. It took me a while to realize that there was a parallel story between my past self and my present self, and I make them join in the end. And that seemed to have worked once I got there. And I, I think I came up with that during a process conversation with you and Chris. I recall that. Again, this is one of the things where I feel like I know where I need to end my stories. However, having not yet finished a novel, I can't be 100% sure I'm right about this. Hmm, interesting. I'm sure it'll evolve over time. I have figured out where to stop my short stories, and I think overall I'm pretty happy with that. Do you figure those out, like, early on? Fairly early on. It just kind of occurs to me. Do you need a lot of subplots? Are you a person that naturally inserts subplots, or are you a person that has a hard time? I haven't thought of the word subplot in like 15 years. What does he mean by that? It's the second story. It's what the it's what the best supporting actor is up to. Give me an example. There is an emergency that this person has to attend to, but also in the background, their marriage is falling apart. I see. Yeah, it never occurred to me to ask if I need subplots. My problem is there's just too much material, but I wouldn't call those subplots. I always get a lot of extra material too. It just kind of occurs to me like various characters doing their own things. So they just kind of develop their own subplots. Hmm. We'll see what that's to say to it. We'll see. Does it have to have a happy ending? Does it? Does it have to have a happy ending? No. Absolutely not. If you yeah. read my memoir someday, listener, it is not a happy ending. It has to have an ending. So no Neil Stevenson stuff. So what is the ending? So Bickham answers these questions, but before he gets those questions, we get his bigger picture, and we're going to pass that to Professor Rene to explain. Professor Nelson. So Bickham says that for maximum effectiveness, you should start your story at the time of the change that threatens your major character's self-concept. And what is a person's self-concept? It's kind of how they see themselves and fulfilling their purpose. The example he uses in the book is there's a secretary. But she's not a stripper and she's not a disgruntled housewife. She actually has a real job and you could probably switch this person out with a male office worker that's facing the same issue. Yes. I was like, great. It's a woman that's completely boring and has no sexual tension obviously associated with her. I, I, was, I was all for this. And in response to that, I will say that he uses the she pronoun and the he pronoun throughout his chapters. He makes a point to switch them. So everyone's included. How lovely is that? What a concept. This guy's a genius. Yeah. I appreciated hearing a her once in a while. Anyway, so the secretary feels that she's very efficient on top of everything. And then the, the office gets computers. Dun dun. <laughs> so 1993. Yeah. And then she has to like adapt. But she's got her own thing. No, I'm efficient. I know my system. But the computer is threatening to her. So this is going after her self-concept as like the best secretary ever. And so the story starts when the computer is crashing on her, whatever, and we see her self-concept being in jeopardy. Right. And that change has to be external, apparently. And I actually, I came up with some examples of this in other forms of literature. At least I think it fit. So the most popular Game of Thrones. The king comes to get Ned when he's considered himself retired. And he sees himself as a protective father and is afraid he won't be able to protect his children from court life. So they're isolated, they're safe. He's already had that world of danger and he survived the war and he thinks everything's fine. And then his buddy, the Robert Briathian, I believe, comes in and says, will you be my hand of the king? And that's just going to open up a can of worms. 
Uh, another one was Outlander, if you'd like some tri time travel porn like I do. Claire sees herself as a woman of science and a wife ready to start her life post-World War II. But her concept of being a wife changes when she travels back in time to a world of war and love and marriage. So I found a little counterexample here, which is Bickham's idea is like before your story, the protagonist has a self-concept that they are comfortable with and that they like, and that then something externally disrupts it, and that's going to, to propel them. But I wonder if he's missing a whole second side, which is that all the people out there that have a self-concept that they don't particularly like, and they want to be something different, and the novel starts where they have the opportunity to change. I think a lot of YA is like this, you know, lonely little me, I'm not getting to do anything, nobody likes me, I'm not special, suddenly world changing event comes in and I become the kick ass person that does stuff. I can kind of see that, I hate mentioning Harry Potter, but that is pretty much Harry Potter, right? He's living a crappy life and then he gets elevated to wizard status. I'm trying to think of others. The Giver? Yeah, that's, you know... That is interesting. The Bridget Jones Diary. Bridget Jones Diary? That's not young adult fiction. I mean, certain not a women's fiction, or there's a lot of women's fiction that starts with the protagonist taking stock. Of, Back in college, I was on track to be a head lawyer, and now I'm at home with two kids. How did this happen? Well, that's, a, that's the classic scene and structure bit and plot. You're right, but they've been this way for a long time. Their self-concept has changed from what they idealized it to be to something else. I mean, was their self-concept threatened by the external change and in them adapting to it, that's how the end of the story happens is when they've adapted to the external change in some way. But what if the external change is the opportunity to change? So it's not threatening but it's a chance to make things right. Then it's a happy ending? I'm saying the, this instigating moment. Mm. Because like this concept here is that, you know, something bad happens, something changes, and then they need to struggle to get back to where they were. But what if they've been in a place where they don't want to be? Right. And now's a chance to remake themselves. It's kind of like crawling themselves out of a bad situation. Hmm. Yeah. I can see how that might put a flaw in this, but I also want to kind of give him some credit because I think it's the word threatens. He uses the word change that threatens your major character self-concept. And maybe he should have used a different word because that makes it seem like that external event has to be bad. It just has to be bad at the time. People like their crappy lives sometimes. They have their pattern. They know it might be bad for them, but they don't want to change. Even though it's a positive thing, that positive thing is threatening their self-concept, even though we objectively look at it going, that's a crappy self-concept. I don't know. I can see both sides to that because a lot of young adult fiction works like that. They didn't have quite the young adult. They had a lot of young adult books back then. But nobody read them. But nobody read them but children. Yes. I actually was working at a Borders when Harry Potter came out. That was weird. It took me another decade to actually read the first book because I was like, why are all these adults buying this book? Did you do the Harry Potter release parties? At Borders? Yeah. No, I didn't. I didn't work. Oh, that was so awesome. It was, was fantastic. So awesome. We were sitting there waiting for these and they had all these kids in their pajamas and something comfortable beyond them and they were all rereading the previous book so it'd be up to par on what it was it renewed your faith in humanity i would say if there are any ex-borders employees out there who worked that night i'm sorry i hope everything is okay and that you survived <laughs> those squealing children running through the store oh they were it was lovely it was, well, it was so lovely because you, you weren't working that day <laughs> that's what i'm trying to say like if i had to work that shift I would have been like, this is the worst day ever. Am I getting overtime for this? Am I getting time and a half and hearing the squealing and the cr and then cleaning up afterwards? Can you imagine the amount of Cheerios and those cheddar fish all over the carpet? We have lived very different lives, dear listener. <laughs> but what 
I want to say is I think that his definition works. It's just that he forgot a, a whole different aspect to it because he assumed that people self concept was what they wanted it to be. Mm, not who they thought they were. That you can tell a story from someone who everything was going well and they liked their self concept and then it was threatened and they have to recover. Mm -hmm. Or you can go by someone that really doesn't like their self-concept, they're not very happy with it, and they get a chance to do something else. And you're right, most opportunities also have the edge of it being threatened. Even if someone doesn't have a very good self-concept of themselves, still it all works. So even if you have an opportunity to be something better than that, you still have the risk of leaving behind something you're comfortable with. I will say for memoirists, even though he doesn't even mention memoir, to me, this really spoke to me. It's like, oh, that makes sense. If you're writing about identity, especially, you need to know what your self as a protagonist, your self-concept is and see how it's threatened. And that totally makes sense to me. Now, I'd like to contrast his attitude about where you start a story with the most common advice that I hear, which is you start it as close to the action as you can. Or you... Uh, in Medeus Res. In the middle of things. In the middle of things, yeah. And I don't think they're mutually exclusive. But just because something's happening, that isn't necessarily the moment that the central character feels their self-concept is in jeopardy or is reaching for a new self-concept. Right. The rule is that you start as close to the action as possible and that grips the reader but Bickham says that you should start with the external factor that is threatening the character in the very beginning. Which could be actionful. Yeah. Oh, yeah. A lot of times I would imagine that that's very full of action. <laughs> but then the point isn't to throw a whole bunch of action to engage your reader. It's to throw that action in to start this process for the main character. Or to establish that this is where the character is mentally and has to move forward from. I thought that was interesting because I've never heard that before. But it makes sense. It makes a lot of sense. And it actually helps you narrow it down. Maybe there's this bar fight and there's this point where they have to fix the bomb. And there's this other point where like the wife leaves them or all those things. But of the three of them, maybe it's the wife leaving them that actually is the emotional bit. Yeah. Well, so I've always had the problem. I've mentioned this in the podcast. And probably everybody in the Bay Area I've been in a workshop with has heard me lament on this. It is the problem with the point. What is my point? What does my character, as me as a character, maybe as a child, want? And I'm like, I'm a kid. <laughs> but this makes so much sense. It's like, oh, I can start with what my past self's self-concept was and how was that threatened. And suddenly my brain just started putting things in order. I still write, I have to write them down. So now imbued with all this idea of where to start a story, we use that to inspire our exercise for this week. So the plan is that we will take our first chapters and take a good hard look at where the protagonist, or in Renee's case, where Renee is at that point, what their self-concept is and how it is threatened, or what opportunity do they have for change. And we're going we're gonna to write those down and then we're going to talk about the process and what we got out of it. I think going forward that my goal is to follow the advice in this book as closely as possible. This chapter has a really nice game plan section. It's literally called a game, game plan. plan. <laughs> so it should be easy to find. And it asks you questions about your story. Like... Think hard about your most major character and what makes him tick. I actually, in my notebook, I just started like answering these questions. And it was a really good exercise. And I'm hoping that I continue to use these questions, these sort of bullet points to go through my own work and pull out the most Bickham approach to the story. And maybe I'll use it, maybe I won't. But I'm going to go all in on what he's suggesting and see how it turns out. So, you know, we talked about Bradbury and how you have to kind of read it slow or read the chapters multiple times. He talks in metaphor. There are no metaphors in this. When you read it, though, you should read it with a pen in your hand and a pad of paper next to you because he's going to just throws activities at you. He bullet points and numbers them. 
But just reading them is not enough. You actually got to like follow through. That's my advice here with this book. It's not dense in the sense that it's difficult to understand. It's just the amount of information he's giving is, although valuable, is quite a lot. Okay, so let's get to writing. Let's get to writing. Well, we're back to writing exercises and all the work that that entails. Yes. But it's a little different when you're doing it on your own stuff because it's not just something that's sitting there, but you kind of kind of potential like, oh, this could work. Yeah, it's harder when it's your own stuff. It always is. So in the appendix one, uh, Bickham gives two examples of how to start your story. And one of them is very short. It's from his own piece called Drop Shot. And I think this makes sense just kind of to get us in the mood for evaluating these, but just to read it and read his commentary on it. This is uh, excerpt two of appendix one. Yes, there's an appendix and there's lots of examples line by line. So what we're doing today is rewrite our introduction so that it fits the structure that Bickham has proposed. And one of those things is to make sure that the external change that is threatening the character's self-concept is revealed very early on and that through concrete details, the setting is, is put in place. So this is the very beginning of his book, Drop Shot. Al Hesser's letter arrived early on a beautiful October day in Dallas, the kind of day that makes you forgive the ugly sky anvil days of spring and the endless dusty furnace of summer. A day perfectly cobalt clear, with the temperature at 70, and only the faintest breeze out of the south. Only a crazy man could fail to rejoice on such a day. Unfortunately, it was the autumn I was pretty crazy. He says, um, lines two and three, the change is specified at once with no delay of any kind, the arrival of the letter. The time and place of the opening are also set up in the first dozen words. Right. So it says specifically, the change is specified at once. Al Hesser's letter arrived early on a beautiful October day. And then he goes on to lines three and six. Concrete physical details are designed to establish the setting, not in the abstract, but in the gut level of physical sensing. Right. So, which is funny because he talks about the sky and we've all been warned not to describe the sky. But it's a be very beautiful sky. So it's okay. And right. he does use specific details. And finally, line eight, a second hook for the reader. What does he mean? He's crazy? Why is he crazy? A change in the form of a letter has already come, although we don't know its contents yet. But as in the Higgins excerpt previously examined, the change hits a character already in an abnormal, threatened state. So right. the three things that are the change, some concept of where they are in discrete details with sensory details and that they're in an altered state or they're in a different mental state than they want to be or to use this term their self-concept is threatened and it's important i think to note that we're adding the creative element in here right it's easy to look at formulas and think it must be stated out loud and yeah it sounds like the change really does need to be stated out loud. I would say though that the self-concept is implied. He didn't say anything, but I feel like just the beginning of him describing the sky very accurately, he seems very even keel, right? This narrator is somebody who can look at something and they can react to it in a reasonable way. So when they say that they are pretty crazy, I feel like, that makes it the external issue. Even though the self-concept isn't like, I'm a totally normal dude. One day I go crazy. It doesn't have to be explicitly stated. And in fact, sometimes things that are explicitly stated just makes you look kind of like a noob. So here's what I had. This is one of the characters of my story. It's like I said, it's set in a fantasy world. And there are people from our world that are going to show up and they're going to have an adventure. Sufi Ravenous tightened her grip on the coarse stones of the tower wall and angled herself out the window. Thirty feet below waited the unforgiving cobblestone ground, but Sufi's eyes stretched further, beyond the fortress's courtyard, 
past the battlements of its protective walls, down to the ocean gray in the early morning light. It was that flat expanse of water, even more than impenetrable mountains to the south or the gloomy marshes spreading westward, that reminded Sufi daily just how cut off from civilization, from anything important, the town of Inanak was. But maybe not anymore. Sufi had awoken at dawn, her limbs pricked with a thousand invisible needles. It was like she managed to sleep funny on every part of her body. Such a reaction meant somewhere a powerful spell, beyond anything a mortal magic user could harness, had been cast. Sufi could still feel the hairs on the back of her head standing up. Not that they ever laid flat, she was blessed, cursed, with voluminous black halo curls. But the point was, she could feel the magic residue. The overhang of the tower's slate roof blocked much of the sky, but the section Sufi was interested in lay just out to sea. Yes, there. It was not so much a beam as a ribbon of light twisting downward, its edges flashing silver to a rock outcropping. From her vantage, Sufi couldn't see the sand embankment that connected the tiny island to Inanak, but she could make out a corner of a gray stone building. She repositioned her hands and knelt on the window ledge. There was a stone missing and the gritty mortar dug into her knees. Sufi hugged the outer wall, her cheek pressed so close she inhaled centuries old mildew that permeated the fort. Now she could see most of the hero's shrine and the ribbon connecting it. The portals open, she squealed. And then the precariousness of her position finally connected in her mind, and her heart went racing, not from excitement, but from terror. This wouldn't be a big deal if she'd been able to learn the feather fall spell, but she hadn't. A pile of broken bricks on her window was all she had to show for a week-long effort. Not that that would matter. The heroes had arrived, and that would change everything. Ah, uh, wow. That felt very solid. Now, you'd read my original opening, too. Yes. This is tighter. I could see things. This is a much, I wouldn't say much better opening, because that's judging one way or another. But I think it's more carefully crafted. A given it's not a draft anymore. It's a revision. So, yeah, I am on board with this one. <laughs> For listeners, my original version happened when Sufi's just about ready to go into the, the this hero shrine and confront the heroes, but it basically follows a conversation where she is explaining that she was told not to do this. So they're walking and traveling, and I'm giving backstory. Right. But I was having to manage a whole bunch of different backstory. Right, you were managing a lot of the um, world building mm -hmm. and trying to stuff in a lot of world building with just someone walking into like a temple and there was another person there so there was information about them and it got you into the action but i this definitely like you said i part it down to just like the most critical information yeah i think that's really important in the beginning i would say that a lot of sci-fi breaks that rule and i don't think for a good way people just tolerate it i don't like those books but this one is great because I feel like I'm getting to be in the world for a while before I get all of the rules of the world. You know, I don't want to have to take notes while I'm reading this book. This, though, I can totally see the things that Bickham was talking about. One is very, like, in your face, which is what he wants. After the first paragraph, you say, but maybe not anymore. You've said that there is a change coming. She's not sure if a change is coming, but she's anticipating one, mm -hmm. right? So that immediately turns into the question, right? The reader question is, what is changing and will it change? And then I want that answered later, which you do answer. One thing his example gave me permission to do was not to tell you exactly what the change was, not to explicitly state. So I originally had this written with a lot more dialogue and a lot more details about these people coming from our world to be heroes. And I cut that all up. I have just the fact that something has changed there. And then I've got the fact that there's this magic beam coming down and a portal is open. And I, at the last thing I say, the heroes had arrived and that would change everything. I want to just say real quick that in my classes when I teach, students think that Tension or anticipation is a matter of withholding information from the reader 
But what that does, what they end up doing is they withhold critical information like details. <laughs> they withhold what's happening and going on. And I'm just like, I have no idea what's happening. And then they go, but I'm supposed to not reveal everything right away. It's like you're not revealing the things that need to be revealed. You're not hiding the things that need to be hidden. You definitely hid the things that needed to be hidden, which was good. You gave us what we needed to know to be there. And when you hinted at it, it wasn't that you were withholding information. It's just that you're revealing that a change is occurring. Mm -hmm. So to me, anticipation and tension was set up perfectly. You don't need to state it out loud, right? You don't need to say whatever's going to happen. Mm -hmm. You gave right. enough. Or I didn't need to go into the backstory of like, she had studied the heroes arriving before. Her grandmother told her about this. Was it critical that they be let in? That, that There's a whole bunch of other world building elements that I just completely cut out. I decided what I was going to concentrate on was to show that magic happened in this world. Yeah. And that it was medieval through the structure of where she was at. Yes. And not worry about any of the other particulars at that point. Right. And it could come in later. It'll come in in conversation. It'll come in, you know, in description. It'll come in with backstory. Honestly, I have seen stories, a lot of fantasy ones, that do do that, where they're like, her grandmother taught her all this stuff. And it's within the first four paragraphs. And again, it feels like I need to take notes. You did comment that on my first draft. <laughs> like, wait a second, there's a whole bunch of details here. Do I need to know this later for a quiz? Yeah. Yeah. So... <laughs> Th that's not a, that's a familiar feeling for me when I'm reading a lot of fantasy and sci-fi. It's like, oh God, I have to take notes. This is very much what Bickham is asking you to do. You are giving details, but you're not bogging us down with, you know, world building. You're just setting up the tension in a very clear, solid way. And you also gave fantastic details. Like, I know exactly where I am. And in fact, I loved where you started. So you did the, the double in Medeus Res. You did the in Medeus Res and you revealed the change at the same time. She's gripping on the core stones of the tower, angling herself out the window. <laughs> That's the first line. That's awesome. <laughs> Already I'm thinking she's an adventurous sort. Right. I wanted to establish Sufi's character. Mm -hmm. much too and it was funny some of the things that came out when I was writing this were things I hadn't thought before were important like this is mostly who she is but I, I'm really pushing these parts of her personality right away well that's all going to become part of her self-concept right I would assume personality goes with that right she's meant to be both someone that doesn't necessarily think things through but okay. is passionate and the other element that I want to convey is that she's not very good at magic. Ooh, I like that. So like you're giving her personality and that's already building the world for me. Like who is this person? I'm getting to know this protagonist, but I'm getting to know them from the first line. And, you know, my anticipation is fueled when you say, but maybe not anymore, because then I think, what is this plucky girl, <laughs> woman? Plucky. Plucky, ambitious, fearless person. What kind of trouble could she get into? Oh my God, <laughs> a lot. So this is the book I'm getting into and I've only gotten through paragraph one and a line. So I think Bickham, unfortunately is dead, but I think he would like this. I think he'd think you nailed it, especially in that first paragraph. You just, bam. I said what I liked about his example is it really freed me up from feeling like I needed to go any further. And this is about 400 words. So this would be about the first, usually chapters start kind of mid-page. So this would probably extend on to the second. So before you actually start getting like dialogue with other people or other elements put into that. But it's not too much information, which I think I have a tendency to do. Yeah, I have the tendency to do that too. So this is a really good example, even just for me to have in front of me to see how it's done. Now, what I don't know is how well this will play out to the rest. Because sometimes you get a great couple of lines opening a chapter and you love it. But then mm -hmm. it's sometimes you run into problems because you can't transition into the other stuff. My assumption, my reader assumption 
would be that she's going to go. Okay, I'm getting off the roof or I'm, you know, I'm, I'm moving towards the next step. Right. It doesn't end with her falling at this point and splattering on the ground because that would be the end of the, the book. But. That would be the end of the book. <laughs> and no, she's too smart for that. She's a nimble, a nimble protagonist. How did you feel revising this? Do you feel comfortable with the changes you had to make in, in order to fulfill his structure? My writing process was that I had this idea for the novel and I wrote an original version of the scene. Like this is the one that, that sparked my mind. I'm going to write this. And then I wrote a little bit more and then I went back to the beginning and I completely rewrote the original Sufi character and the setting and all that because more stuff had gelled in my mind. And then by the time I gave that formal first chapter to you and my other critique groups, I was working on chapter two and now I'm working on chapter three. And around chapter three, I realized I have not fleshed out this town enough or this fortress. So I've gone back and done a ton of research about what these places look like in my mind. So I knew that chapter one wasn't quite there anymore anyway. It was in the back of my mind that I needed to redo it. And it was kind of a nice little break. Like I could actually go and redo some of the stuff at mm -hmm. that beginning. So when you revised in the past, how different was the process of using reader feedback in the past, but now using the stuff this from is, this book? This is different. Is it? feedback is, I like this, but I didn't like this, or maybe you should do such and such. There is a lot of content feedback. So what's your process for changing stuff? So, so it's content feedback. You know, I would have liked to see this person more. I didn't get enough into this person's head. I, see. I would like to see in conflict right here. Could you have started it with dialogue as opposed to prose? This is, regardless of the story, the structure you need to do is, what is the character's self-concept? What is the challenge to it? Now that you know that, that's the scene you're going to write. Critique stuff usually is like at the edges or the, you need to think about some, something's wrong here and you need to go and break yourself and figure out what's wrong and fix it. And this is someone giving you exercise. Write it according to these principles. Yeah. And that was helpful, you think? I would not have written this scene without that directive. Okay. It would, it would have been rewritten, but it would have been something different rewritten. And how do you feel about, like, if you had to judge one or the other, do you prefer the one you've done with scene and structure or just pure feedback? Because you're going to get both now. Um, Are you going to keep this one? I think I'm going to keep this one. Oh, point um, for Bickham. But, but I also think that a dead author writing a book on scene and structure <laughs> isn't going to be able to give me all the feedback that I need to revise my novel. So obviously... Right. My critique group out there, I still need you. <laughs> the love is still alive. <laughs> I I think it was successful. I really liked it. And it's interesting because if I had read that without knowing any of this stuff from the book, I would have liked it and not been able to point out why. Mm -hmm. So Renee, you have a piece. Yes. From your memoir, you've rewritten the first section and we are going to talk about that on our bonus podcast on Patreon. Renee, tell us about Patreon. All right, then. <laughs> all right, listeners. Patreon has all the fun stuff. And if you would like to do these activities with us, which we really encourage you to do because, I mean, we're just getting better every time. Come to pa Patreon and sign up for the Pinto the Fabulous tier, and then you can do these activities as well. And you'll get our feedback, just like you are hearing the feedback on the episode. Also, there's a lot more stuff in the book than what we talked about in the episode. So if you want to know about every detail of the book without actually having to read it, you can read my snark notes. What's awesome about that is they might be a little more entertaining than the book itself. Because <laughs> I get a little snarky as the name implies. With each book, your snark notes change a little bit. Like you were your most snarky with Gardner. Well, yeah, because he was a more, jerk. And then you were less snarky <laughs> with Bradbury because he was, he was, he's a sweet guy. I was nicer with Bradbury. I still crack a lot of jokes though. It's very much, I think, like spark notes, but ones you want to actually read. 
So you get that with the Patreon and also the bonus podcast where we usually, for these exercises, it wouldn't be fair if only one of us got the opportunity to do the exercises <laughs> and get themselves critiqued. So right. instead, we both get to do it. Only one person gets the bonus podcast, which will be Renee. Anyway, yep. so that's our Patreon account. And don't forget to check out the website because the website we have, which you don't have to join Patreon to go on, has all of our show notes. And there's links and there's breakdown of what we talked about. So if you've forgotten anything, you didn't have to take notes. You could just go to the show notes and get them there. And there's a link in the show notes to a place for just to give us feedback on the show. Which we would really appreciate. And if you leave an Apple review, we will read it on the podcast. <laughs> Unless it's mean. Then we won't read it. Then we won't read it. No. Okay, Only good guys. reviews. All right, guys. Two weeks from now, you take care. Bye-bye. Bye! Words to Write By is produced by Renee Nelson and Kim Smith-Adler. Our theme music is Roll Back the Carpet by Cool Cat Music. Have a great day. Or what would you call it now? DVD instructions? Oh god, I'm old. What's the next one up?